Hey everyone, this is Teresa from Base 10 Montessori and I hope you're having a great day. I'm having a wonderful day. The weather is beautiful outside. Unfortunately, it's also peak spring allergy season and if you can't tell by my voice, I'm just a little bit extra nasal today. So I hope that you can bear with me as I try to get through uh, this video. Um, I had a little bit of an, a sinus infection earlier in the week, so I'm finally getting over that. I'm ready to record. So hopefully you don't mind my voice quite so much. <laughs> so today I want to talk about the absorbent mind again. Um, and I want to talk about chapter three. We got through chapter one, we did chapter two, now we're on chapter three, and that's titled The Periods of Growth. And if you don't know much about Montessori, but maybe you've heard a few terms, you might have heard of the term uh, the planes of development. So when we're talking about the periods of growth, uh, that's can be thought of in the planes of development when we talk about Montessori philosophy. And I'm going to get a little bit more into the planes of development here in this chapter, but I'm not going to go super deep into them. But if it's something that you're interested in, if that's a topic that you'd really like to learn more about, particularly uh, the second or the third plane of development, um, please let me know by putting a comment down below. Now, since I'm trained in the three to six age group, my my training is in the first plane of development. So I talk a lot about that. Most of my videos are geared toward that, but there are other planes as well. And if you're interested more in that second and third plane, let me know. Um, and I will try to find a guest that I can invite on to talk that's trained in that age group that um, can talk a little bit deeper about it. So let me know what you're interested in as we go through here. Leave a comment below if you're interested in one topic more than the other and I'll try to make a video that helps you out in terms of what you're interested in. So let's see what we have in store here. In my book, uh, it, chapter three starts on page 15, and Maria Montessori talks a lot about the development of early childhood education, which is not a thing that existed much before Maria Montessori came along. So that was still kind of a new philosophy at her during her time, and she talked a lot about child psychology and she says on page 15, the human being was of little account in the early years. So we know that this had to be a progress, right? This had to be a process that came through um, over the years of understanding how to understand children. And uh, she said that modern science understands the successive phases of growth. So basically that's saying that at each stage of growth, something different is happening, right? pretty common sense. Nowadays, we know a lot more about early childhood. We know a lot about child psychology. We know a lot about child development. And I think most parents understand that there's different phases of growth with young children. But remember, during her time, this was pretty important. Um, this was a pretty important concept. It was a new concept. So we have to put ourselves uh, in the mind of somebody who's figuring this out uh, really 100 years ago. And actually, Maria Montessori was born in the late 1800s. So if you think maybe even more than 100 years ago. Uh, and so this is something that she had been advocating about for a really long time, talking about early childhood education, talking about the importance of that zero to six age group. And uh, not everybody was on board with it. So she goes on to say, there comes a time when one psychic personality ends and another begins. And again, I want to point out that the word psychic here is not to be understood in terms of the supernatural sense of the word. So it kind of, it refers more to the inner mental mechanism that allows the child to develop that inner development. So a lot of the times when it isn't this hard and fast physical development, she uses the word psychic to, um, to kind of label that inner development that's going on. One that's not quite so easy to to see visually. Like if we take a camera inside the body or inside the brain, we could see a lot of development happening, right? But there's also this, these inner developments going on, like memory and language and, and um, all of those types of inner things that you can't see developing, developing, but you know that it's happening, right? So she talks a lot about that. And that's where when she uses the word psychic, psychic just keep in mind, it's not a reference to that supernatural sense of the word, but to the inner uh, mental organs inside the child that are developing. And so when she starts talking about this uh, development and what's happening uh, in the successive phases of growth, 
successive phases of growth, she also starts introducing the idea of the planes of development. And when we talk about the planes of development, we're talking about every six years, there is a new phase of growth. So we're talking about zero to six is the first plane, six to 12 is the second plane, 12 to 18 is the third plane. Now, she did label a fourth plane six years after that, but I'm not really gonna get into that by then. You know, you're really, you're really dealing with an adult, right? And I know some of you may, might question that. Are we, are we dealing with an adult when they're 18 years old? I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of debate going on about that. But for right now, we're going to really focus more on those first three planes of development. And in the first plane of development, she talks about these two, two sub-phases, and that is the creation stage and the consolidation stage. And the creation stage of the first six years is zero to three years old. And then there's a second phase, the consolidation phase, which is the three to six age group. Um, during that time, they're consolidating all that they've created in the first three years. And so that's kind of how she breaks up that first plane of development. So she says of the zero to three uh, age group, the creation stage, she says the adult cannot exert upon it any direct influence. And by that, she doesn't mean that your actions or your emotions or whatever is happening around the child at that age. She's not saying that that doesn't have any impact on the child, but what she says is that it doesn't have direct influence, but the child during that age is going to absorb everything in the environment. So they're not learning directly. They're kind of, it's this absorption. If you want to think of it in terms of a sponge, right? And she compared uh, the child's development, that absorbent mind to a sponge very often and saying that if you put a sponge in clean water, it's going to absorb everything. It's going to absorb all the clean water. But if you put it in dirty water and you put the sponge in dirty water, it's going to absorb clean water and the dirty water, right? It's not going to separate the two. It doesn't have a filter. And that's exactly what she talks about when she talks about not being able to exert any direct influence on the child during that zero to three age group. They're just gonna absorb everything. Now, in the three to six age group, there's that phase, that sub phase of consolidation. And things start to change. And she says the adult can start influencing directly. And she says the personality under, undergoes great changes. So if you are a parent or an educator and you're thinking about the first six years of life, and you can kind of think about, well, what is a child like during those first three years? And what is a child like during the, the ages of three to six? Now, it's one plane of development, according to Maria Montessori. But if you think through that, you can really start to see that there is very much that difference, that change going on at three years old. And if you look back at your own life, you're also going to think, well, when did I start having memories? When did, when, what's the earliest memory that I can come up with? And if you think back, it's usually around that age of three, right? And that's where she said there's something different going on. That's when the mental organs really start connecting to the body. And that's why we can start remembering things. And that mental organ of memory, again, is what she refers back to um, the word psychic, right? That internal development that we can't physically see going on. So that's how she starts the chapter. She breaks it down into that, that first plane of development along with the two subphases of creation and consolidation. Now, on page 16, she starts talking about the second plane of development. Now we know that this is ages six to 12 because it's every six years, there's a new phase. And of that second plane of development, she says, mentally, he is in a state of health, strength, and assured stability. And she says that physical changes signify the changes between the first and second plane. So you can kind of see this change ha happening physically because the child starts losing teeth, right? And I had one head of school say, well, they take six years to put themselves together and then they get to be six years old and they just start falling apart. And that's when you know they're in the second plane of development. <laughs> so I thought, oh, that's kind of a fun way of remembering um, or at least it's signifying that change. So they have, they start losing their teeth and, and you'll see that physical, physical growth start going. And uh, my dogs are barking in the background. So let me pause for a second. 
Okay, I had to pause for a second because FedEx was delivering a package and my dogs were barking incessantly. So let's get on with it. I think we were talking about how the children start losing their teeth and then they start growing. And you're going to see that um, that child get really skinny and stretched out. And uh, no longer do they have the cute baby chubby bellies and all that stuff. They've, they've stretched right out, right, in the second plane of development. Uh, she also said that children do tend to be healthier in the second plane of development. So, again, this is not necessarily a guarantee for every child, right? Obviously, there are different things that happen. Um, maybe COVID, right? We were all sick for the last two years, I guess. Um, but anyways, the second plane tends to be a little bit healthier. And I don't know, do you find that to be true? If you have children and you've seen these different planes or if you can compare these two different planes right now, do you see a difference? Um, if you have a child in the first plane and a child in the second plane, is there any difference that you can see as far as health uh, between the two stages? And I know a lot of the times when children first start going into school or first start going into childcare, they're exposed to all these germs for the first time and they spend a lot of the year being sick. And we kind of try to warn parents about that when they come in with like at the toddler age or in the primary age group. And we try to tell them, well, if they haven't ever been in childcare or school before, just keep in mind they're probably going to be sick a lot that first year. Uh, by the time they get into the second plane, they usually do start to have that resiliency to a lot of germs. So if you agree with that, I'd like to hear your comment below. I'd be interested to hear if you think that children in the second stage are healthier. Um, and just let me know if you have found that observation to be true in your experience. And then she starts talking about the third plane of development, which is ages 12 to 18. Now, we're getting into those teenage years, and that is a really interesting age group. And Marina Montessori said that this age group actually parallels the first plane of development in many ways. And it is, of course, a period of great change at the same time. And she also said they're weaker in their health during the ages of 12 to 18. And again, if, if you have the chance to think through from your experience, if you have children in uh, at least two of the, the planes, or maybe you have children in all three planes, uh, what do you see going on as far as physical health? Do you see any difference there? And she also said that the ages of, between the ages of 12 to 18, again, just like the first plane, there are two subphases. You have that creation phase and the consolidation phase. Again, those are going to be three years each. So you've got, you know, you've got the 12 to, to, you've got the 12 years and then you have th that three years of creation and then you've got three years of consolidation. So the, the child is creating the adult. So again, you're going to have that, that split between the two subphases. And do you see those subphases? And that's usually the time about when we're seeing children go into middle school, right? And we have that isolated. We have those years naturally isolated, right? That middle school age group, and then they get into the high school age group. So we can almost see those subphases going on naturally in our traditional public school system. Too. We naturally divide those up. Um, even though they're all kind of getting into those same teenage years, we do recognize that there's very much a difference between a 12 to 15 year old and a 15 to 18 year old. Very different. So she noticed that that there could be uh, those two different subphases in that age group and that it mirrors the zero to six age group. And do you think that's true? <laughs> There's a lot of things that you could say, hmm, I really do think 12 to 18 year olds are very much like the zero to six year olds. And I did have a chance to um, spend some time in a middle school classroom <laughs> this past year. And wow, my goodness, um, you know, I, I can see it. I can definitely see it. There's a lot of stuff going on in that age group and it's so out of my element. I don't really have a lot that I can comment on as far as that, but yeah, I could definitely see how that might be the case. Now on page 17, she talks a little bit more about the second plane and she said, the second plane is suitable for giving children their first basic ideas of culture. Um, so just to give you an idea of what is culture, well, and if you look at the first plane of develop the first plane of development, our goal as as adults, as primary teachers, is to help the child adapt to their first place outside of the home. So 
parents have the, uh, the obligation of helping their child adapt from um, being born into this world, right? Into the family unit. The next transition is from the family unit to the child care or the school. And that's where, as teachers, we have the obligation to help the child adapt to this new environment. Now, the second plane, the, it has a little bit of a different role where the, the Montessori teachers spend a lot of time in the second plane helping children adapt to the world outside of the school. And that's kind of what she's talking about here as far as this is a good time to help them adapt to culture or given the basic ideas of culture. So for example, something that you'll find going on in a lower elementary room is that they're gonna start organizing outings and explorations outside of the school. And the children are gonna be a lot more responsible for this. It's gonna be a big part of, of their work. Uh, perhaps they need to be the ones calling uh, different places. If they're interested in going out somewhere, let's say they're interested in going seeing this play, this play is coming to town, they really wanna go see it, they've been hearing about it. And so as a Montessori teacher, I'd say, well, that sounds great. My question to you is first, how are you, how are you going to get the money for this? And then the second thing is who's going to call and order the tickets. And so what I would do is help them think through the process of, I want to do this outside of the school. How am I going to do that? How are you going to arrange transportation? And I'm going to make sure, you know, if they're motivated to see this, I'm going to help them understand the steps that it takes, but I'm not going to do it for them. I'm going to guide them in helping them go outside of the school and do something. And that's really where they're going to start experiencing the culture. So culture is really we're thinking about what's happening outside of the school and help them figure out more of the world outside of the school system and outside of the family unit. So again, uh, the second plane of development, they're a little bit healthier, they're stronger, and they're more able to handle culture, particularly more so than a, a child in the first plane of development. And then by the third plane, as many of us already know, that they are a little less calm than the second plane. And they're not as healthy. Uh, they have discipline issues and rebellion during this stage. This is pretty common. Um, and she said, and this is an interesting quote, quote, that she said that schools take no account of this. There's all these changes going on in the third plane and schools take no account of this. So in her time, she said that this really wasn't considered. And I think from her perspective, uh, children were expected to be adults at this age group, right? Sit in the chair, listen, passively absorb. Um, and maybe teachers at that time didn't understand that in that third plane, they do have a lot more health issues. You know, they certainly have a lot more things going on with their hormones during that age. There's a lot of change there. And my question to this that I've been wondering, because I've, I've been working around children for 20 years now, and I've seen a lot of things happening, and I've talked to a lot of friends, particularly friends who have daughters, and maturity it seems to be coming a little bit earlier. And I just wonder how that affects the third plane. So my question to you is, if children are maturing a little bit faster physically, um, how does that affect the planes of development? And this is something I'm just totally throwing out there. So if it's something that you are able to think about or put into context, and it'd be really interesting to get um, the perspective of a doctor and see if they have any, uh, any ideas of, of what's going on physically with children right now, I'd be really interested in hearing more about that because I do think that we're seeing a shift in uh, physical development in our culture maybe not so much the emotional development, right? But the physical development is changing a bit from a hundred or so years ago. I'd be really interested to hear uh, people's thoughts on um, maturation and the planes of development in that regard. So maybe if you're trained in the second or third plane of development and you can give me a little bit more insight in that, I would love to hear from you. So just something to think about. <laughs> and then on page 18, um, there is this passage that I absolutely love. I didn't want to type it all in here because it's a long passage, but it was interesting because she talks about, and let me bring it up here in my book, because she talks about, my, my voice is cracking. I'm trying not, but it is a little bit. She talks a lot about this observation that, um, that she had of men in university at the time. And I thought this is really interesting. And I've just thought, Maybe we could compare this to our to our 
culture today and see how true it is of today or maybe it's not so um starting on page 17 she said in my student days the young men did not shave and it was comical to see them masked in the great halls mostly with beards more or less formidable and all wearing mustaches of which the of which the variety would lead yet these fully grown men were treated like children they had to sit and listen do as their professors told them depend for their cigarettes and tram rides on the generosity of their fathers who were only too ready to scold them if they failed in the examinations and these were adults men whose intelligence and experience would be needed one day to direct the world the mind would be the instrument of their labors in the highest of the professions they were the future doctors lawyers and engineers then she goes on to say who goes to a doctor only just qualified young men have spent years in listening to words and listening does not make a man only practical work and experience lead the young to maturity i'm just going to pause right there because i thought this was an interesting passage to have these adult men in your university studying and yet there was almost this juvenile quality about the way they were they were living their life they didn't have the responsibilities and i start to think you know okay so m most children these days go on to college not very many of them decide to go to work pretty much the majority now that go on to that further education and she says that years listening to words does not make a man practical work and experience lead the young to maturity and you just wonder that that protective environment of the university it, it seems to delay maturity a bit and it doesn't it's not very practical right because nobody's learning a skill skill during those those years a lot of the time so we're learning how to think learning philosophy uh we're not learning how to put thoughts to action or how that works out practically or how that works out as far as getting a job and so she had this same thought going on and i know a lot of people are, are probably debating this today and thinking well is college worth it wouldn't it be better to go to a skills trade right there's that debate going on right now like am i going to really put myself in debt a hundred thousand dollars in debt to go to college and just to let you know, I mean, I have a master's degree in education and um, when I, well, when I had my bachelor's degree, I only made about $20,000 a year. Um, not very much for, for paying for a college degree. And then when I got my master's, I made about 40,000. And it costs, you know, about $40,000 to get your master's or at least mine. Uh, other masters probably cost way more than that, depending on what you're majoring. So um, she kind of took note of this a lot of this passive learning is going on in the ages of you know that third plane of development and then in that fourth plane of development it's all passive learning and it does not lead a man to maturity but practical work and experience do lead the young to maturity so that's when she became an advocate of really making sure that that young young children and young adults get a chance to work with their hands now that doesn't mean that she um, discourages academic learning uh, because maria montessori absolutely loved academic learning i mean she she fought for a chance to get her academic learning when it was basically unheard of for a female to do what she was doing so this isn't to discourage uh going on to learn more but it is to say we need to look at how we are um, offering education. Are we offering experience? Are we offering practical work in association with higher learning? And that's where I want you to think about what she's trying to say right here. She does go on to say, education is out of control and cannot change its inveterate habits. All it has done so far is to recognize in the growth of the individual different forms of development at the various stages. So in her time, it was just basically recognizing okay children are able to do something at this age at this age at this age but still learning was done passively and i think that we're still doing a lot of that when we get into elementary school and up you know we're really still avoiding that connection between 
the practical work and experience in academic learning. And really the two should go hand in hand, but we have a lot of difficulty putting those two ideas together for some reason. And so from her standpoint, we needed to, to get the hands involved. That practical work experience really needed to play a part in our learning process. And not just in the zero to six age group, but she'll go on to, if you, if you know anything about her, what she advocated for, for the, the third plane of development, she advocated for something called an air kinder. And she believed that, uh, that children at that age group really, really needed to be able to work with their hands in association to what they were learning academically. And so she proposed a farm school, but she also definitely supported the idea of apprenticeships, right? Getting the children out into the world and working, not just learning passively, but actively working. And so this is where some of those ideas uh, came into play. And, and I have worked at a school that did the air kinder model. So I, I've gotten to see it a little bit, not not extensively, we didn't have a high school, but I've worked at places that did have a middle school with an air kinder. And it's really important to be working with the hand at those ages and connecting whatever you're doing physically to what you're learning academically. So here on page 19, I have this text right here in blue because I really feel like this would sum up the chapter. If I was supposed to talk about, if I could talk about this chapter in just a, just a, paragraph of words. This is kind of what I think would be the most important part of the chapter. And it says, the most important period of life is not the age of university studies, but the first one, the period, the period from birth to the age of six, for that is the time when men's, man's intelligence itself, his greatest implement is being formed. But not only his intelligence, but the full totality of of his psychic powers. Again, the word psychic, not supernatural, but inner mental development. And so she really stresses that, yes, the, the other planes are important, right? However, the most important, most important plane for learning and development and for poten potentiality is going to be in that zero to six age group. So it go just goes to show you how important that age group is to her and how she really believes that that sets the foundation for anything that the child goes on to do in, in life in the future. So, and she goes on to say, why should it be necessary for the human being to endure so long and so laborious a babyhood? None of the animals has so hard infancy. infancy. And that's an interesting thought right there, isn't it? Uh, to compare us to animals, animals grow up so quickly and usually, you know, they have one year of development and then they're completely mature and they're ready to have offspring of their own. But we really labor at it for a long time, right? And, and even then, we, even when a child gets to be 18, we're still like, well, you're really still a child for a good six more years, right? You can do a lot of things. You can be an adult in many different ways when you turn 18. But we all know that that that, that frontal lobe development. There's a lot of things still going on developmentally in an 18 year old. So they're not, even though they are an adult, there's still a lot of things going on in development at the age of 18. She goes on to say, in man's case, therefore, we are not dealing with something that develops, but with a fact of formation, something non-existent has to be pr produced starting from nothing. And so that development of, of the child, of that, that formation that's happening is really unprecedented. It's very different among humans than it is amongst any other animal species. Uh, to co continue on page 19, she says, a mind different from ours is needed to take that step. The child has other powers than ours, and the creation he achieves is no small one. It is everything. Not only does he create his language, but he shapes the organs that enable him to frame words. Again, the organs, here she's referring to the mental organs, those mental organs that are developing. Language is a mental organ. Men memory is a mental organ. Not only is the child creating language, but he has to shape that mental organ for language. 
and that internal development. He has to have um, not just the ability to hear and reproduce sounds, but he has to have this mental organ for language in order to do this. He says, this wonderful work is not the product of conscious intention. We adults know what we want. If we desire to learn something, we set ourselves to learn it consciously. But the sense of willing does not exist in the child. Both knowledge and will have to be created. So that's an interesting thought too, that the child is developing the will. And this is a big topic in Montessori as well, the development of the will. So we have to develop knowledge, right? In order to say, you know, I want food. I have to be aware of it first. There has to be that knowledge of food. I want to eat this. I want to eat this particular food. Again, as they get older, they'll, they'll have a craving for a particular food, not just I'm hungry. Now, when you feed me, I'm not hungry. But then to go on later and say, well, I want to have yogurt, right? That's specific. The child has to have that knowledge. But they also have to have the development of the will, the willpower, the physical ability and the knowledge of being able to get what they want and having that preconceived thought of, I want to do this, and then having that physical ability to go and do it. So all those things are mechanisms that have to be developed in a child's life. And so I had here in red, I have a question because there are times when Maria Montessori is, is talking about this development of of the child, the, almost pretty much that, that non-existent state to something that has to be created. And I also know that she did not promote John Locke's tabula rasa theory. She did not believe that that child was a blank slate, that they, there's a lot more going on than the tabula rasa theory allows. And so if she didn't support John Locke's view of the child in this regard, it gets a little tricky when she starts talking about how the child comes from something that's non-existent and then creates something. And I just wonder how her thoughts are, differ from John Locke's theories when sometimes they sound kind of similar. But I know that she does, she specifically says in different places in the book that the child is not this, this blank slate. So as you're going through the book, kind of think about maybe in what ways does it sound similar, but what are the ways in which she shows that the child is, is not the way that John Locke viewed, uh, viewed the child uh, as a blank slate. So for me, that's kind of a tricky question, and I, I kind of come back to it a lot, and that's just a question that I have, is what is that difference? What's the difference between what she's saying and what Locke's saying when they talk about starting with nothing and then creating something? And um, I have to tell you, I don't really have a good explanation of that. It's kind of one of those questions I have. I know there's like that slight difference in what she's trying to say, that a different, different context of what she's saying, and yet I can't quite put my finger on how it's different, so... <laughs> If you have a good way to, to differentiate between what Maria Montessori is saying and what John Locke is saying of Abula Rasa, I'd love to hear it. So leave a comment below if you have kind of a better take on those two, um, those two different theories, those two different ideas. So on page 20, Maria Montessori goes on to say, if we call our adult mentality conscious, then we must call the child's unconscious, but the unconscious kind is not necessarily inferior. We find it at work in every species, even among the insects. They have an intelligence, which is not conscious thought, which is not conscious, though it often seems to be endowed with reason. It begins with knowledge of his surroundings. And let's we'll stop, there, stop there for a second, because is this what makes it different from John Locke? This unconscious thought. You know, like, like the animal kingdom, they have an intelligence, right? This knowledge of some sort of knowledge of surroundings. There's something going on there, right? Even though it might not be considered conscious thought. And is that what makes the difference between a blank slate and, and not being a blank slate? So just a little side note there. I don't know what you think, but could that be what she's referring to when she differentiates from Locke's idea of the blank slate? 
So anyway, she talks about a lot of the assimilation that leads to adaption. And again, I kind of referred to this earlier when um, the first job is to help the child adopt, adapt from birth into the world. And then, you know, you assimilate and then adapt. And so there's that assimilation that leads to adaptation. There's a special specialized sensitive sensitiveness, and this can kind of refer back to the sensitive periods of development. If you don't know very much about the sensitive periods, there are um, specific windows of development where a child is hypersensitive. So language is one of them, orders one of them, and um, the sensorial, the, the refinement of the senses, refinement of movement. Those are the four different areas that um, are sensitive periods. The specialized sensitiveness uh, help the child adapt. And of course, absorption of impressions. So those three things um, really help the child take in his surroundings and adapt into the world. And then language as an example here. Among the thousands of sounds and noises that surround him, he, the child, he hears and reproduces only those of the human voice. So sounds of human speech make on him a deeper impression than any other sound. So that's true, right? That the child is hearing all these sounds around them. How does he know to reproduce the human sounds? Why doesn't he produce the sound of a kitten meowing? And let's face it, children do like to produce the sound of a cat meowing. They'll do that. They'll do that a lot through pretend play. Um, but that we're not talking about that in this instance, right? We're talking about how the child is learning to talk. And so the child studies the face, studies the mouth, studies the mouth movements, and reproduces the sounds associated with the adult. And those mean more to him and the sound of a cat meowing and the dog barking. So that is something that's really interesting to think about. And also, you know, we're, we're still doing the whole COVID thing. A lot of people are still wearing a lot of masks. And I think by now we can honestly say that the, the masks with young children, and particularly with infants um, who really study the face and, and learn a lot about talking by watching uh, mouth movements, uh, that's going to have a big effect on children growing up. The fact that they spent their first couple of years of life, perhaps, um, with around people with masks on. Uh, and so we won't really know the data on that. We won't really know just how intense that impact is. Probably several years from now is when we'll start getting a hint of how detrimental that was to their development. So I'm interested in seeing the effects of that but you know it's also very sad to think about all those babies not being able to see faces because it really is an important part of the absorption process when it comes to language and maria montessori talks a lot about language so we'll talk a lot about language throughout this entire book so it does come back it'll probably come back into play many times uh throughout several chapters of this book so montessori said this language he acquires in infancy is called his mother tongue, and it is clearly different from all the other languages which he may learn later. The child has not only absorbed words and their meanings, he has actually absorbed sentences and their constructions. And that's really interesting. He's not just absorbing, I know this word. He's absorbing the construction of language. So it's very important when you're talking to the child you know, don't just stop at one word, but, you know, have conversations. The child is absorbing everything. However, when you're giving, when you're teaching a new word, uh, you do want to label it one word at a time, go very slow. But again, you don't want to stop having um, the child, you, you don't want to stop the child from having that exposure to conversations because the child is absorbing the construction of, of sentences here. So, it's amazing what a child's brain is absorbing from all around them. So just keep that in mind when you're, when you're talking about things. And also keep that in mind in what you're talking about because children absorb everything. They don't just hear everything, they absorb it. And then she goes on to say, in order to remember something, it is necessary to have a memory. And this the child has not. On the contract, 
on the contrary, he has to construct it. And again, here, the memory, she says, is a mental organ that has to be developed. And the child does not have this when he's born. So how do you have memory? You don't have this when you're born, so you have to construct it. And that's what she calls a mental organ. And again, then gets back to that word psychic. So she says, one must be able to reason, but this also is a power which the child has to make. So reason is a mental organ. There. We, ac we acquire knowledge by using our minds, but the child absorbs knowledge directly into his psychic life. The child undergoes a transformation. Impressions do not mer merely enter his mind. They form it. The child creates his own mental muscles, using for this what he finds in the world about him. We have named this type of mentality the absorbent mind. And again, that's where she gets the title for the book, right? This, this entire theory of hers, uh, the absorbent mind, is really where, where she has started her entire philosophy of education. This absorbent mind, it starts right here. Those mental muscles that are being developed. On page 22, she says, how marvelous. If all knowledge came into our minds simply as a result of living, without any need for more effort than is required to eat or breathe. Supposing I said there was a planet without schools or teachers where study was unknown, and yet the inhabitants, doing nothing but live and walk about, came to know all things, to carry in their minds the whole of learning. It is the child's way of learning. He learns everything without knowing he is learning it. And in doing so, he passes little by little from the unconscious to conscious, treading always in the paths of joy and love. He says, human learning seems to us a great thing. To be aware of our knowledge, to have the human form of mind. But we have to pay for this. For no sooner do we become conscious than every Fresh piece of knowledge costs us effort and hard work. So for us, it's going to take a lot to, work, to learn. We're going to have to put effort into it. But she says not so of the child from zero to six. That first plane of development, they absorb everything. Not effort to learn this. Now, I will say as a three to six-year-old teacher that children with disabilities, children with uh, some sort of developmental issue, uh, we do have to put more effort into that. There, there, we do have to change the way we teach. But for the most part, and then and then and then they still develop through absorption, right? So they're still absorbing things. It's not that that process has stopped, but we are going to have to work a bit harder, and we are going to have to be more specific in our lessons and we're going to have to lead the child back to that lesson again and again and again for them to retain it. So that's not to say that that children don't have to work at what they're learning, but in that zero to six age group, there is a lot of absorption going on and that is going to be the primary teacher and that we will come in and all we have to do as teachers for that zero to six age group is simply start linking the child to the material, the child to the environment displaying for them what it is to to do something or to say something. And so we are this dynamic link between the child and the environment. And that is our role. It's not to teach. And you'll hear that from zero to six-year-old teachers in the Montessori age group. Uh, we say, you know, we, we don't tend to refer to ourselves as teachers. We refer to ourselves as guides because we're guiding the child. We are the link. And we believe very much that the child wants to learn, that the child will learn, and the child absorbs things uh, so easily. All we have to do is be that link and then move out of their way because they're in a phase of, of self-perfection. They're interested and they're invested in their self-perfection. And so when we show them what to do and they give them the opportunity to do it, they will repeat over and over again that presentation until they have mastered the skill that that presentation offers. And 
a lot of the times when I refer to lessons, I say presentation because that's really what it is. For my age group, I present a material. I don't teach a lesson. I present a material. I present something. So it's very physical, usually a lot of concrete work, and the child absorbs it. So that's a lot of what's happening in that zero to six age group. She says the movements the child acquires are not chosen haphazardly, but are fixed in the sense that each proceeds out of a particular period of development. When the child begins to move, his mind, being able to absorb, has already taken in his surroundings. And before, when I was talking about those specialized, um, that, that, that sense of um, those specialized time for learning things, those sensitive periods, refinement of movement is one of it. So refinement of movement is one of those sensitive periods that a child goes through in zero to six in which they're trying to perfect perfect their body. So when you see a child repeating something, maybe they're just obsessed with climbing a tree, they're obsessed with climbing something, or they're obsessed with um, cutting, something like that. That's the refinement of movement. That is the inner child, the, the, the inner teacher speaking to the child saying, I need you to perfect this, this calling to the child. And so just remember that in that zero to six age group, that there is that refinement of movement that's calling to the child and asking him to perfect certain movements during that age group. And that is the window of opportunity for the child to perfect that movement. Because if he learns that movement later, it's going to require a lot more effort. It's going to cost the child a lot more. He won't just absorb it. And he won't want to repeat it as much either. So there's something special going on in that zero to six age group when it comes to movement. And on page 23, she says, if you watch a child of three, you will see that he is always playing with something. This means that he is working out and making conscious something that is, is unconscious, something that his unconscious mind has earlier absorbed. He constructs his mind step by step till it becomes possessed of memory, the power to understand, the ability to think. And again, that's that mental organ, the idea that the child's mental organs are developing, constructing his mind step by step. He's working out something. So uh, a lot of the times as adults, particularly as Montessori teachers, we're called to scientific observation, observing, just watching. And one of the things that uh, we do a lot of in Montessori is we just sit and we write down what we see and we don't interpret it. We don't even say that the child is happy. If we see them smiling, we'd say the child is smiling. And we wouldn't say the child is smiling because somebody walked in the room. We'd say the child, the corners of the child's mouth are up. Um, and then we might write that the door opens, an adult walks in. Uh, so in that sense, we would try to keep it as objective as possible. We wouldn't say the child was happy and the child was smiling because somebody walked through the door. We'd go through and we'd isolate everything because we really want to be scientific about it. And so when you're talking about this, watching this child of three playing with something, um, it's always interesting to kind of step back, do some observations and try to be really scientific about it and see if you can work out afterwards, after you've done that scientific observation, really work out, okay, well, what did his mind earlier absorb? What was that? So anyways, it could be an, an, an interesting observation exercise if you get a chance to do that. If you have a three-year-old and they're playing with something, maybe take the opportunity to sit back and do an observation and keep it very objective, keep it very scientific, don't interpret anything. And then afterwards, really think about that. Read it over, read your notes over, and see if you can figure out what it is the child has absorbed and that they're working out from their unconscious mind into a conscious thought. So again, he constructs his mind step by step, like we said before. He says the child is endowed with great creative energies, which are of their nature so fragile as to need a loving and intelligent defense. When we understand that the energies belong to an unconscious mind, which has to be conscious through work and through an experience of life gained in the world, we realize that the mind of the child in infancy is different from ours, and we cannot reach it by verbal instruction, nor intervene directly in the process of its passing from the unconscious to the conscious. And so this is a really great way uh, to end this chapter uh, by thinking about 
again, we, we talked about the age of university studies and that practical work is, made, is what makes a man, not by listening, right? And again, it comes back to that zero, zero to six age group too, where she said, we realize that the mind of the child in infancy is different than ours. You know, it requires experience of life gained in the world. And that is how a child goes from their, their unconscious thought to conscious through work and through experience. Now, a child's work is not the same as our work, of course, but we want to understand that the child has work to do because the child is creating the adult. The child is growing up to create the man. And so their work is to become an adult. And we want to give them their work that they need to achieve that, right? To be successful in that. And she talks a lot about, um, I think in the next chapter, how, you know, the this may be a little dark, but how the adult's on the way to death, but the child is on a path to life. Very different work going on. Um, so it's kind of an, an interesting to think, thing to think about, about that life gained in the world, experience of life gained in the world. And the, the zero to six-year-old child really needs that. And they need it in a step-by-step -step basis and very specific into what their needs are at that time. And again, you're still going to see in that third plane of adult development, the second plane of development, adulthood. Again, we come back to we need experience of life gained in the world and not just verbal instructions. And that's going to help us, helps the child go from unconscious to conscious. And it helps the man go from somebody who is incompetent to capable, right? We don't want somebody who just sat and listened to lectures to the next day going into performing brain surgery on us. We really want them to get some experience out there first. And that's really what we're talking about here, that active experience uh, with the world. So there you go. That is chapter three. I hope you <laughs> can bear with me as my allergies are driving me nuts right now. And I'm, I'm certainly probably don't sound the best, but I loved chapter three. I thought it was really interesting. And I look forward to telling you about chapter four. I think chapter four is probably a pretty short chapter. Uh, so I think that one will be a little bit less to talk about. So if you like chapter three, if you've read chapter three, go ahead and leave a comment down below. It always helps me when you leave a comment and when you share the video. And of course, it really helps when you subscribe to the channel as well. And I hope that you do want to subscribe to the channel if you like what I'm doing here. And I'm hoping to put out some more videos this week as long as my <laughs> voice can actually work. So hopefully I'll see you later on this week in another video. Until then, I will hope that you are having a great week and enjoying the beautiful weather that's around you.